think this particular text is probably one that most pastors have taught on. So there's not going to be a lot of new or hidden insights, really, but just a careful looking at what Paul wrote as he's sitting there in the Mamertine prison in Rome, knowing that in just a few days or weeks, he's going to be losing his head. Because as a Roman citizen, he was not to be crucified. Roman citizens, for the death penalty, it was beheading. What would you write if you knew that you just had a few days to live? What would you send to the most important person in your life? What would you write down? That's what we're reading here in 2 Timothy, Paul's last letter. And when you read through the letter, you don't see any whining. You don't see any, this isn't fair, or this is unjust, or I'm going to cancel Nero out of my life. Yet this is just, what can I impart to my most important person to help them in the future years because I won't be here? That's called the legacy. That's called the real inheritance. What can I impart? And so as you read this, you're hearing that heart of the Apostle Paul, but you're also hearing the Lord Jesus to us. Through this letter, he is speaking to us. And especially as we face now 2021, having come through the fire of 2020, it ain't over yet. And so in our travels through both the United States and also other countries, I have seen more division in the body of Christ than I've seen in my entire Christian life. And it's over things that are secondary, non-essentials as far as the gospel is concerned. And not only so, but what I see happening is the love of the brethren being shut off because the other person doesn't agree. Jesus gave a warning in Matthew 24. I know it's a long introduction here, sorry. But Jesus gave a warning in Matthew 24 to the disciples. And the context was the last days. And he told them, because, the love, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will grow cold. You know that the word love there is the word agape. Who gets agape in this world? God puts his agape in the believer. Is it possible that we get so upset over the iniquity abounding that our love can shut down toward others? Have you ever become angry over seeing the injustice or the things that aren't right and, and, and the things that are just so upside down and justice isn't being done? Have you ever become so angry that you find yourself not just despising, but even hating. That shuts off the love of God toward others. We have to be careful how we live our life as a believer in these last days because the enemy of our soul, Satan, wants to shut us down. How does he shut us down? By causing that love to be blocked off because we're offended seeing the iniquity, and we're not loving into the situation as Jesus did with us. 51 years ago, the Lord chased me down, chased my girlfriend down, apprehended us, blocked us in, put some Christians right in our face, and then he gave us faith to believe. He chased me down. You realize that's grace, that God chases you down when you were running from him? Let's get back to the text, sorry. <laughs> from verses 1 to verse 7, you find seven commands that Paul gives to Timothy. I'll let you find those on your own, but we're going to focus on four commands that are specially seen in verses 3 through 6. Four commands. 
Four illustrations of a Christian's resolve in serving the Lord Jesus, and so important as we head into 2021. And here are those four commands. Endurance, focus, obedience, and labor. So let's start with a word of prayer, and let's see what the Lord is going to speak to our hearts today, all right? Father in heaven, we're grateful for your word. We thank you for how you've protected it through all these centuries. And here we have this Bible in front of us, and we're able to hear the words that the Apostle Paul wrote to his son in the faith, Timothy. But Lord, we want to hear your voice to us, because that's the most important voice it's not our voice, it's not the social media voice, it's, it's your voice to us. So speak to us, Lord, by the Holy Spirit from this text, and may you give us courage and faith to follow through, in Jesus' name, amen. I'd like you just to follow along as I read this text, verses 1 to 7. But it's not just information. I want you to see if you can hear the Lord speaking to you. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. You know, as we look at this text, we see the word therefore coming. And as you already know, when you see the word therefore, you ask, what's it there for? And so that means you go before of what, uh, what Paul wrote before that, and that, that's a foundation for what he's going to be saying next. And so in verse 1, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace. So there's a therefore, so you've got to go to the previous verses. And, and just for the sake of the fact that we're in 2021, just listen to these previous verses. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me, this is verse 13, chapter 1, in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. This you know, that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. Hermogenes developed Hermogenized milk, I think, back in the Greek times. <laughs> the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not afraid of my chain. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day, and you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. And then he says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Keep on being empowered. Be strong in the, in the Greek tense of, of, the, of the word there is keep on being strong. Not just be strong one time, but continuously be strong. Keep on being strong and empowered by the grace that's only in Christ Jesus. You realize that grace provides strength. And we see that connected all through the scripture. God's grace brings strength to you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, the Lord said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made complete and perfect in weakness. God's grace and God's strength are together. And so in these commands that Paul is going to give to Timothy, 
they are reliant upon God's grace to give him the strength to follow through. And the same is true for us today. I think as I've done my walks around the neighborhood up there in Colorado where we live, um, the Lord has used that time. It's about two and a half, three miles around the neighborhood. And I have a chance to talk to the Lord. And I talk out loud. And, you know, people that are looking out their back windows think there's a crazy guy walking around. But, you know, it's just how I get in touch with the reality of, of, of talking to him and, and listening to him. And, you know, there, um, as, I'm, as I'm walking, especially, you know, just this year, God's grace has been so much impacted um, upon my heart that it's so important for me to catch that understanding, to go deeper with that, and just what he's done. And, you know, as I walk around the neighborhood, uh, the backyards have these wrought iron fences that you can see through. And, and so, you know, there's all these dogs. I mean, different kinds of dogs, Rottweilers, Chihuahuas, all kinds of dogs. And so I've learned to name them as I walk. And so, especially with the Rottweiler that comes, you know, and when you're not thinking, there's that tingle that goes through you when that happens. Well, I've named him Pride because, you know, pride is like a barking dog. You know, when you look back at when you have sinned against the Lord, hasn't pride been barking and trying to get you to, like, follow through? But he's behind the fence. He's not good. He can make all the noise he wants. But still, I don't like that tingle. So I just name him Pride because I got to watch out for Pride barking at me. And then there's little chihuahuas and they're, they're just so annoying. And so I, I call them like unbelief, just unbelief. And so, you know, it's a long walk. And so there's lots of dogs. And so I'm just constantly reminded that I've got to put a guard on myself because those things that pull me away are just barking dogs. They're not going to come and bite me unless I go up to the fence and stick my hand in it. And then the neighbors will call the police and then I'll be have a jail ministry, you know. <laughs> Timothy, because of the grace given to you in Christ Jesus, because you've heard sound gospel truths from my words, my actions, and my attitudes. Timothy, because we're to disciple other believers and raise up faithful sound leaders which will impact generations to come, therefore, Timothy, Verse 3, endure hardness. Because of all that's happened, because of all that God has done in your life, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Endurance. But it's important to understand that in the Greek, endure hardness means to share with others in the same troop. Some of you have been involved in the armed forces and you know what it's like to be in that troop and everybody's having a hard time, but you're sharing in that hardness. And that's the meaning of this. And it's like the Lord Jesus saying to us, listen, fellowship with me in my sufferings. I did this for you. You can do this. My grace is sufficient. You can do this but share with me. I'm right here with you, but we're going to go through this together. And so Paul is telling Timothy, share with me in these hard times. Christian fellowship is so important. The English Standard Version puts it this way, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. The Amplified Bible puts it this way, Take with me your share of the hardships and suffering which you are called to endure as a good first-class soldier of Christ Jesus. The New American Standard Bible puts it this way, Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. The New Living puts it, Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Man, we are in a culture that is so soft and, and we just fall apart over the slightest trial. And I think of our brethren that 
are in suffering right now in prisons around the world, being tortured, trying and being, being accused of things they never committed so that they can be put on trial and executed. And the faithfulness that they are going through. It's not about a soft life. It's about a faithful life. It's about hanging on to the Lord Jesus and depending on his grace because that's all there is to hang on to. And the pain is tremendous. It's so hard to imagine. You know what the opposite is of endure hardness? It's cut and run. Cut and run, abandon post, avoid at all cost, bail out when it gets tough. And, and, you know, quite honestly, we felt like that at times. I mean, to have it come up and you have that feeling is one thing. Yielding to it is another thing altogether. Wow. Listen, God allows hardship because he chooses to use it to develop character in our life to prepare us for heaven. God is more interested in our character development than our creature comforts. And we get that flipped around, especially in this country. We think that, well, if God is pleased with me, then all these things will work out. But as you read through the New Testament, it's so clear. God uses everything. He puts it in his special mosaic to, to create the image of Christ in your life, in my life. And, and the longer I serve the Lord, <clears throat> the more I realize I don't know. And I want to go more simple and more deep in the things of God. I'm tired of, of arguing about details. I want to know him. Is that what Paul said? That I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. I don't want to just know about him. I want to know him. Know him personal because it, it changes you from the inside out. The grace of God that is only in Christ Jesus and is available in overflowing measure empowers us to endure hardships. Are you going through a hardship right now? The key to endurance is the grace of God and inviting God to fill your life with his grace. It's fresh, it's new every morning. His mercies are new every morning. His faithfulness is great, endurance. Number two, focus, verse four. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Focus. This is again from the Roman soldier to which Paul was chained, maybe two of them. But listen to how it's put. The soldier doesn't entangle himself that he may please him who enlisted him. That's the goal of the focus. It's not that I'm not supposed to get wrapped up because that's not what we're supposed to do. No, the goal is I want to please my commander-in-chief. <clears throat> As a Christian, your commander-in-chief ultimately is Jesus Christ. And your goal, your focus is I want to live my life to please him. We can so get off focus I got off focus with my wife the other day. Um, you know, when we were going together in high school, we used to pass notes to one another because there were no cell phones. And so I thought the other day, you know, I'm just, I'm going to send my wife a love note. I mean, we've been married 51 years. And so, so I went on, and I have an app here that you can um, go on to um, and create birthday cards, anniversary cards, and then little special note cards. And so I'm going, hey, I'm just going to do this and email her this special love note, you know, and that'll gain me points. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I get it all set up, and I send it off to her. And then I got the note on my email that, you know, it was sent. And so it was in the morning, and so I'm waiting all day. 
And it's like she's not saying anything. I'm going, you know, I really, I mean, I, I poured my heart out on this card. And so, you know, toward the afternoon, I'm saying, Jeannie, do, do you happen to, like, get an email from me? And she goes, no, why? I'm going, well, I'm just asking. I don't know. And so I'm thinking, it says that it was sent. And so I, I'm, I don't know what, you know, maybe there's a, a problem. And, all, and then all of a sudden, right before dinner, she's sitting in the living room and she goes, what's this? And I'm, I, I just, I don't know what to say. And she says, how to cleanse your bowels every morning. <laughs> well, it was, it was one of those free apps that has ads attached to it. <laughs> so I said, well, do you have a problem? You know? <laughs> uh, well, it's two strikes, because basically I'm too cheap to pay for an ad, and so it's a free ad. So I lost my focus. Let me tell you, if the soldier loses his focus, the whole troop is in trouble. Our focus can't just be a soft life here. Our focus has to be to please our commander-in-chief. That's what Paul's telling Timothy. I want to please my Lord. But I don't please him by trying to perform for him and getting me to like me. I please him by walking in love and letting him be my most important factor. Do you realize that when Paul says about pleasing your commander or him that enlisted you, it also implies that you can displease the Lord. Displeasing the Lord doesn't mean he throws you out of the family. I mean, we have kids and grandkids that do things that are wrong and self-destructive, and, and, and we can be grieved because of their actions. It, there, it's behavior that's not right. It's behavior that's self-destructive. And we can be grieved and displeased. But it doesn't mean we don't love them. But you know, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. As a Christian, you can grieve the Holy Spirit by having attitudes, actions, words, that are grieving the heart of God. As we've, as we've traveled around um, in many places ministering, sometimes I've, I'm just seeing this whole thing of, of holiness and purity before the Lord is just thrown away and, and, and the desire to be cool has you know, allowed all kinds of defilement in the attitudes and in the words and in the mindsets. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. I need God to be strong in my behalf. I need all the help I can get. These are tough times. And I got to keep my focus. It says here, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself. Man, that word entangles is an important word because it means to become involved in difficulties or complicated circumstances from which it is difficult to escape. It's only used twice in the New Testament, here and in 2 Peter. 2 Peter 2.20 says, For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled then in them and overcome the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Focus. Man, it's so easy to get entangled with what's going on. Is that like the rapture going to happen? You know, lights go out? This is good. Focus. Dude, this is great. <laughs> Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. 
2 Corinthians 5, 9, therefore we make it our aim. This is cool, cool scripture, it means focus. Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. That's focus. Colossians 1, 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And Hebrews 13, 21 make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Endurance, focus. And here's the third one, obedience. And that's in verse 5. And also, if anyone competes in athletics... He is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. You know, during this whole pandemic, remember that there are athletes training for the Olympics. And they go through difficult, difficult disciplines for their particular sport. If your sport is track and field and you're doing javelin, you develop certain muscles and practices that have to do with that particular sport so you can try to get a gold medal. And you have a diet that's strict and you have your disciplines and all, and you're doing it, you're doing self-sacrifice for for years and years. And then all that gets shut down. And, And many of those Olympic athletes are going, what's my purpose If I can't run, if I can't jump, if I can't throw, if I can't do all these things, my whole life has been wrapped up on it. You have to compete according to the rules with all of your disciplines. And then let's say you go to the Olympics and you decide to take performance-enhancing drugs just to give you an edge. Then you get canceled out because you didn't do it according to the rules. Do you know the kingdom of God has rules? There's only one rule. It's called the law of love. The love of God. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Walking in love. It's obedience to the rules. To circumvent those rules is going to cause trouble. It's going to cause difficulty. It's important to guard our hearts, to let God's love fill our hearts so we can pour out his love. I cannot manufacture God's love in my life. I can't do it. But I can ask him to fill me from heaven with his love so I can love others with his love. But when my heart gets hard against people because they've offended me or they just are, um, you know, that's a ridiculous, I can't believe that policy, and then we just shut down and we feel so self-justified, no, are we walking according to the law of the kingdom of God, which is loving them with the love of Christ because Jesus died for them. As radical as they might be and as offensive as they might be, Jesus died for their sins just like he died for yours and mine. And I've got to guard my heart. Satan wants to win on both ends. He can destroy this life and then he wants to mess up your life by being angry at what they're doing. Walk in obedience to the law of God. Loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and loving your neighbor as yourself. That fulfills all the details. Endurance, focus, obedience. And finally, the fourth one is labor. It seems like a random verse that Paul just throws in there. Oh, by the way, here's a farmer. No, 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 there's a purpose. The hard-working farmer must be first to partake of the crops. He's telling this to Timothy. The hard-working farmer. The word hard-working means to feel fatigue, to toil, to be wearied. It's not the fatigue from vain efforts or haughty motives. 
This was doing all things necessary as a farmer to ensure there would be a harvest. You know, when I was growing up, we would go to my uncle's house sometimes in Kansas, and he had a wheat field. Concordia, Kansas was the name of the area. And you know, when you're little, everything is huge. You ever go back to the house you grew up in, and you look in the backyard, well, you look over the fence, look in the backyard, and you go, this is, this is nothing. But when you were a little kid, it was like, wow, you know, it's just out there. Well, when I was a little kid, we'd go to my uncle's house, and he'd be on his combine, and he'd invite me up on the combine. I mean, this is like Transformers for a little kid. And so, you know, I'm, I'm climbing up this combine, and I'm sitting next to him, and this whole thing is going. I mean, it was huge to me at the time. But, you know, my uncle would do the very same things year after year after year after year. The same ground, the same bog spots, the same areas that he had trouble with. Why did he do it? And he couldn't take a vacation. Once that thing went, once it was going, you had to, you had to stay there. Why did he go through all that hard work? To stand just before the harvest and look across his field and see the reward of his labor. The labor was worth it because of the harvest. So what helps us endure fatigue, weariness, toil? Because, by the way, that's a part of the Christian life. It's the reward that he, Jesus Christ, is bringing with him to you and to me. As hard as it is at times, we have to keep our eyes on the harvest. Because I tell you what, if a farmer loses his vision, why is he even going through all the hassle? Getting up so early, working until the sun goes down every single day, dealing with the weather, dealing with the pests, dealing with the market. The hard-working farmer, Timothy, must be the first to partake of the crops. Got to keep our eyes on the prize. Our harvest is the Lord Jesus bringing his reward. It's not the blessings. Blessings are God's grace, undeserved, that, that come to us. It's not that we earned them. It's just, you know, it, you know, it's like taking your kid out to ice cream or something, you know, and you just do it because you love them. You haven't earned it. But Jesus is coming, and it says his reward is with him. And he's going to look at you and me in the face as a believer, and he's going to be focused only on you and say, well done. And that includes a smile. That includes a blessed heart. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'm just so blessed. Here you are. Is it worth it going through the toil, the fatigue? And you're going to get tired. We're going through times that it's just like, I want out of here. Keep on plowing. Keep on weeding. It's part of the discipleship. Endurance, focus, obedience, labor. 2021. Are you ready to give up? You just are at the end of yourself. You've even had suicidal thoughts. I want to tell you, the Lord knows what's going on in your life. He knows how it all came to that. But he's not done with you. And you have no right to go and shorten your life because you're at the end. Your life is not your own. I'm talking to those of you online. Your life is not your own. It's his. 
few weeks ago I was teaching and I said something that the Lord took me to task on. I says, man, I don't want to live to be 100. And the next day on my walks, it's like, the Lord says, um, can we have a chat about that? You know, if, if I want you to live to 125, it's none of your business. Your life is mine. And if I want to use you until you're 125 years old, you're going to have to be okay with that. And if I want to take you early, it's none of your business. Um, we're, we're in this together. You've got to let go of all your worry and your care over all of your, you know, what ifs and the what abouts and where's that going to happen and how is, how's that going to look. Just trust me and let go of this picture in your mind of what you're, yeah, you know, but you, I mean, the Lord and I are pretty honest, and I'm saying, yeah, but man, I'm, they're going to be like carrying me around in a stretcher after a while. I'm going, well, how do you know that? It's like, what are you looking at? What are you so worried about? Today is the only day you're supposed to be worried about, and you're not even supposed to be worried. You're just going to trust me, because you know, you were born on a day called today, and you're going to die on a day called today. And the rapture is going to happen on a day called today. Amen. It's not going to happen tomorrow because you wake up tomorrow's today. It's today. <laughs> so all I'm responsible for is today. You know, you can do this, Nemo. <laughs> you know, today. Today. Be faithful today. I can endure today by the grace of God. I can have focus today by the grace of God. I can be obedient today by the grace of God. And I can make it through the hard, 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 hard time by the grace of God just today. There's nothing wrong with what Paul is saying here. But if we just read it and go, that makes sense, and then don't apply it, we're missing what that's going to be like. Because all of this is going to be intended to draw you closer to the Lord. <clears throat> in Psalm 40, and I'll close with this, in Psalm 40, when you read those verses there, you see David crying out to the Lord to pull him out of the pit. But as you read through the entire psalm, you find out that God's desire was to pull him into a relationship before he rescued him from the pit. There, there's a reality of how God works with us, and that's called relationship before rescue. We want to be rescued. Get me out of here. And the Lord says, well, let's talk while you're in here. No, I don't want to talk. I just want to get out of here. You can, you can like say it and we're just, and, we're, and it's all changed. No, let's talk a bit. Relationship before rescue because what God does in the heat of the furnace in your life is so precious that nothing else can bring you to that. God values those times like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the burning fiery furnace. The fourth was there like the Son of God, as the New Living says. We don't know how long we're going to live, but God does. But here you are today, so live it. Go for it. Do whatever you got to do. I got a purpose to make it through and just have the ropes burnt off as I go through the fire, kind of like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When you lose your focus, the grace of God in Christ Jesus can gently and firm you, get your eyes back on the Lord, the author and finisher of your faith. Are you making up your own rules for life and not according to the kingdom? We have to do it according to his law and just let go of the man-made biases and opinions 
and be obedient to his word. I'm not sure where you're at this morning in your Christian life, but there's a big reset button that it's time to hit and to say, God, I want to recommit my life to you for 2021. I want to finish well. I want to come to the end of the year if you tarry, and I want to look back and say, Lord, I've done what you've asked me to do. It's not a New Year's resolution. It's a life dependent upon the grace of God. 